Well, good morning, LCM. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? You're full of faith this morning. Yeah. Full of his fire. Yeah. Well, let's get into the word. Today is Sunday, September 8, 2024. My, how time flies when you're doing God's will. Say, so we want you to realize something. Come to a grip of reality. That we are currently living in a season of prophetic fulfillment. A season of fruitfulness consisting of growth in discipleship. Amen? Amen. Celebration of marriages. The continual pursuit and producing of children. Both are great. And the joy of sending and settling in new lands. Isn't that right, Bajanelli? Each of these have not been without their challenges and difficulties. Yet we are witnessing an ongoing expansion that God has promised. In fact, get this, guys. All conquests of new lands and territories include opposition and difficulty. Along with the certainty of desert times. Those desert-like moments that God has led you to are for the purpose of increasing your dependency and thereby furthering your fruitfulness. If there's ever a truth to stand on at all times is that although you have been brought to the desert, that is not your end destination. Every bit of it is to deepen your dependency so that there can be a greater harvest of fruit. It is in the desert that you grow to become mature. Everybody say mature. Mature. And able to shoulder the weight of greater responsibility and greater trial. Both are paired together and synonymous throughout scripture. Each of those are his will and destiny for your life. And the end result ultimately is his name being glorified. Glorified in your mouth, glorified in your deeds, that you are far and vastly overshadowed by the greatness of who our God is and his deeds done through our bodies. Turn with us to Psalm chapter 63. Psalm 63. We're going to even begin with the title of the psalm today. Someone say there as you're turning. Psalm 63 in the title says a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness or in the desert of Judah. Verse 1 says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So our times of expansion, of growth, of fulfillment of provision, as well as the weight of greater responsibility and greater trial have a righteous effect when you handle it like David. Right? You can be a person who engages in expansion and God is trying to do something and then it caused bad behavior. But David is giving us a perfect example of what every man and woman of God must do. See, instead of isolating himself in pity, lamenting over his lack, or whining with the what about me, or even retreating from God's presence. David acknowledges the poverty of his own soul within the primary view of, oh God, you are my God. He is starting from a place, elevating his eyes, and acknowledging where he really is. There's a reason that we started with the title of this verse. He's actually in a desert. He is actually having difficulties and trials. He's feeling like it's a dry and arid place. You know why? Because it is. Literally, actually. And David is beginning off with a poor in spirit attitude. He is humbling himself and beginning by setting his eyes and his affections towards the heavens. He's allowing his view of the Almighty and closeness to him to stoke the fires of his own soul and cause him to draw near and diligently seek the face of God. This, of course, should remind us of Hebrews 11:6. 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe, number one, that he exists. And not just somewhere in the universe, but he actually exists right here in the situation that you're in. He's here. David's saying, God, you are my God. He's acknowledging that God exists. 
And Hebrews eleven six goes on to say, he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He doesn't reward some of those who earnestly seek him. He rewards all those who earnestly seek him. And David is putting this on display right here. So look, connect some of these thoughts that we've let out with so far. Yes, he exists. And our tendency is to think that he exists in the highest of heavens, which he does. The earth is also his footstool. But in connection with Psalm 63, he exists in the desert. And he rewards those who earnestly seek him in the desert. When you stand upon that surety, then nothing can take away your perspective as it did with David. Because he began with a clear and, and decisive uh, per, uh, foresight. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. You know, when you start up with the character and the reality of how God is standing with you in the desert, and he rewards your earnest and diligent pursuit of him, it then gives you the ability to express an honest state of your heart, but without the unnecessary mourning and grovel groveling before him. You know, many times we agree with our environment more than we agree with God. We choose to let it be an arid and dry place within our souls rather than just letting it be an external means of God showing his supernatural provision. Every time that we step foot into a desert situation, it seems arid and dry. And every bit of your soul is crying out for more of God. Consider that the most blessed place to be. Amen. Why? Because it removes all extemporaneous means of distraction and self-generated provision. It leaves room only for God and him alone to provide and feed you time and time again. Saints, we need to remind ourselves of something right now. Remind your soul that it is of great value to have a longing to be near him. It is of great treasure to desire to have time with your father. And pursuing Adonai out of desperation. Desperation is when you begin to feel your spiritual stomach claw the backbone of your soul. It is that hunger that I can't live one more second. I can't take one more breath without encountering my God because I know that he and he alone is the only one that can fill and satisfy. View this. Desperation is a gift. I'll toss Santa Claus aside. St. Nicholas can take a back seat to the living God. But desperation is a gift and a blessing. It realigns your vision. It causes you to narrow your focus on the fear and character of God. You know, this is all palatable. It's able to digest if you're just putting this within a time frame of what you expect. Meaning that if we set the expectation of suffering, of being in desperation, then we can pretty much manage it on our own because we know it's finality and end as far as time goes. But just think about, I don't know, let's start with something small. A splinter. A small shard of wood that is underneath your skin. And no matter what you do, if you just scratch your head, there it is to remind you that it is there. And if there was no certainty of exactly when it would be removed, that that little bitty thorn in your side would be freed, then how long could you endure that thorn? How long could you endure that irritation underneath the surface of your skin? You see, when we begin to look at our lives and our journey and following our king, his cloud by day and his fire by night, what he is constantly looking to do is give us the heavenly perspective that overshadows even the smallest of splinters that we endure. You know those little things that just get under your skin. No, don't look around in this room. Don't do that. Let's start with the obvious. How about some lost co-workers that day in and day out Chris is nodding his head very feverishly over there 
your coworkers that day in and day out, there's just small things that greet you. And next thing you know, you begin to cease to have thankfulness upon your lips. And you begin to hunger for something different other than what God has already given you from his character. And that hunger for something different looks like, eh, just find somebody you'd agree with my faithlessness about this person. And that begins to fester. And next thing you know, it's Galatians 5.16. You begin to bite and devour one another. Oh, may this not be so in our own hearts. May it not be present within our own family that's in this room. May we today see that the times of our desperation are a blessing that get our hearts back to the foundation of the fear of God. As Pastor said earlier, David is not using a metaphor or simile in this psalm of being in a dry and weary land. That's where he's actually dwelling. You know, there's no restaurants out there. There's no supermarkets. Water is hard to find, if not at all. David has a mature perspective, though. And it's more about seeing the reality of the state of his own soul and God's ability to cure it than just the lifeless state of his surroundings. Let's take a look at Psalm 63, too. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Now, where is David in this moment again? Not in the sanctuary. David is in the desert. He is yearning. He is desiring the Lord. He's crying out to him as if a man were about to die of thirst in a desert. And then his very next thoughts after declaring his own pursuit of the Lord is, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. Again, where is David in this moment? He's in the desert. And this is what is coming from his soul. This is what is springing forth from his innermost being. Verse 4 says, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. He's not throwing up his hands in desperation and, and, and just defeat. He's throwing up his hands because he is doing so in the name, in the character, and for the very reputation of his God. Verse 5 says, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Can you imagine using this analogy while you're in the desert and there's no assurity of food at all? Do you, do you see what he's doing? <laughs> he's connecting some things that we can easily overlook, but he's in a desert time, and this is the language that comes out from David's inner being. It comes out in this psalm. I will bless you as long as you live. Uh, verse 5, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Amen. I'll do this when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. What do you meditate on in the watches of the night? Are you concerned? Is there a concern and worry and fear that you have about provision, about direction, about God moving? Do you feel the pressure that just sits on you and so it keeps you awake at night? It causes you to wake up in the middle of the night and be worrying? That's not what David is doing here. He is in the desert time and he's saying, you know what happens with me is I begin to realize that my soul is satisfied like the best kind of meal that you can get. You are feeding me and sustaining me as I I remember you as I set my affections towards you and think on all the good things that you've done. I meditate on you through the watches of the night. Come on now, church. It's too easy to let this just go uh, on as if it were a small thing. David is demonstrating what it is like and what it must be like for us. Verse seven says, for you have been my help and in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. In the shadow, you're in a desert. You're longing for a little bit of reprieve from the heat. And he's not looking for a tree or a bush. He's saying, Lord, I want to be under the shadow of your wing. And there I'm going to sing for joy. 
Should, don't you hear the Davidic charter here in Psalm 101? Where are you at, Nolan? Psalm 101, verse 1, I will sing of the steadfast love and justice of God to you, O Lord, I'm going to make music. What happens is that when you're in a desert, in dry times, it's designed to cause you to need to get close to him, to eliminate everything else, to cause everything else to fall by the wayside and only focus on him and yearning for him, longing for him. And we do that by focusing on God's character. See, David is displaying a hunger and thirst here. But let me add one more thing to this. David is longing. He's yearning. He's hungry for the Lord. But can you tell this is not a mournful moment? This is not a laborious lament that he's doing. In my mind, when I think about Psalm 63 until just now, my thoughts have been a very solemn thing. Lord, I yearn for you. I seek you. As if it were a big heavy, solemn thing. But do you see that David is exactly the opposite of that? He's yearning for the Lord and he's like, I'm going to sing joyfully. I'm going to throw my hands up in the air and I'm going to praise you because you're worth it. I'm going to think on you. I'm going to meditate about you. I'm going to remember you and I will worship you. That is a man who's not just saying he's longing for being in the presence of the Lord. It's a man who is entering in and actually being drawn by God to his side. That's what David is doing. We're longing. We're yearning. We're desiring to be next to him. And it produces a freedom inside of us. It produces life that we can run to him. Why? What are we looking at here? Aren't you inspired by this kind of man? You're not seeing a heaviness while he's doing it, even though the circumstances for most men would crush them, would cause them to want to flee from God's presence, and yet he's pushing in. And we're seeing the inspiration of a man who's desperate for God, and, somebody say and, and, and the desperation of a man who's fully trusting that God is going to meet him, that God is going to provide for him, that God is going to take care of his every need. Look how this goes on in verse 8. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. You want to know a secret and treasure to the kingdom? What the sustaining element that being in the desert is driving you to? It is clinging or debunking your mind, will, and emotions to the character of your God. This inseparable connection, this super glue of covenant in seeing the reality of his right hand that has sustained you this entire time. Remember we said earlier that desert of dependency that drives you in desperation is to narrow your focus. It is to clear away everything that clouds your vision of how God has been sustaining you this entire time. See, when that happens, we begin to find the key in keeping a covenant with our king. And that key is, no matter what happens, no matter what scenario or environment or condition I am in, oh God, my God, to you I cling my soul. To you I debunk and secure myself in the fact that your right hand sustains me. Your right hand has never left me. You've always been there to provide for me. When we're looking at this, you begin to have a clarity that there's never been a, been a day of lack. Never been one day of lack. But those moments, those moments when faithlessness starts to creep in, that is the first thing that goes out the window. All I see and feel is lack, and it's everybody else's fault, including my own. There's never been a day of lack with our king. There's never been a moment of failed provision because his supernatural might and power has been with us this entire time. Our response to his faithfulness, our response to his abundant provision at all times can easily be seen in Deuteronomy chapter 10. So everybody turn there. Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 10. Read every day. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 20.
If you had trouble answering that last question, series of questions that Pastor Matt just did, that he just gave you about the fact that there has never been a lack of provision that you've had in your life. Can I give you a fail-safe test to know that God has been providing for you this entire time? You're here. You're actually here. You're, you're here, and we're still moving forward, and God has great things ahead of us, and he's actually challenging us. Did you hear the prophetic voice today? He's calling to us that we would cry out, that we would stir up this desperation, that we might come closer to him because he has yet things that he wants to do in us, through us, and truthfully, even in spite of us. It doesn't matter because he has his work so that helps us in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 20. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. Church, you know this, but when we engage with this and when you start from the place of fearing the Lord your God and wholeheartedly pursuing him, there is a necessity that we don't just do that one time, but that we hold fast to him, that you cling to him. I mean, like if you were going to jump on a motorcycle with one of the games, I mean, that kind of clinging. Is it a fearful thing or is it a joyous thing? I don't know, but I'm going to hold on. It's going to be exciting, I can tell you that. A desperate clinging because, like, my life, as if my life depends on it because it does. I, I'm no longer talking about the motorcycles, just in case. Everybody's like, oh, that's true, that's true, hold on. You've got to hold fast to the Lord. That begins with you having a fear of him and him only, and you cling to him. You serve him because of what he has done. He is your praise. Not only of what he has done, about who he is. He is your God. He has done mighty things on your behalf because of his faithfulness to the covenant promises with you. And he's never failed to provide everything that you need for life and godliness at every single turn in your life. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Well, turn with us to Psalm 119. We're going to pick up in verse 30. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies. Oh, Lord, let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Look, God's abundant provision has always allowed us to have a clear target to attach our souls to. And therefore, direct our strength towards. His way of faithfulness has always been there. His rules and statutes are an ever-present source of surety of how to please him. His testimonies abound every day and the source of what we can attach our entire being to and one that will never be shaken. Many times when I'm asking the Lord to expand my territory, to increase, increase my heart, my fruitfulness, I'm crying out, Lord, I need more of your abundance. The correct place for me to start is, Lord, enlarge my heart. Expand my capacity to behold what you have already given me. What you've already placed in my storehouse. What you've already invested in my life over the course of whatever number of years. And, Lord, enlarge my heart to run with endurance in what you've already given. Enable me to run in the way of your commandments that are already not just set before me, but let me be honest with you, saints. It's what he's put in me. Yeah. Just, just recount for a second. What have your eyes witnessed and seen over the course of your time being born again? Is it absent of miracles? Is it absent of his supernatural power? Is it absent of his kindness to whisper his revelation and truth of who he is to you? You know, in fact, there's not one day that goes by that is absent of his interaction with us. But our cry and our heart this morning is, Lord, enlarge 
the capacity of my heart to engage with you. Soften it. Let it not become callous. Let it not become blind to opening its eyes and seeing what you've already done. Lord, may I not throw away or discount the very things that you have been so faithful to do for me over time. Come on. That phrase, enlarge my heart, is an, an, is an interesting one. If you have a more literal translation that you're reading from, you're going to see something along those lines. Enlarge my heart. If you have something that's trying to help you to understand, they may say that you might expand my understanding. That just doesn't carry the same kind of weight. And NIV 84 says that you have set my heart free. What happens when you're burdened is that you have, it's like you have a constricted heart. All that you can see is the worry. All that you can see is the doubt. You feel the pressure. It's like things are closing in on you. Lord, enlarge my heart. Set my heart free that I not, may not have fear of anything else but you. You who have provided so well for me every single day of my life, even before I was serving you, when I was your enemy, I did not reap the full benefits the full punishment of what I really deserved. I mean, my sins were stacked up to the heavens, but you yet provided for me. You yet drew me. Your loving kindness even drew me to repentance. How much more now that I'm your son? How much more now that I am longing to be with you? That I'm moving towards you. May my heart be enlarged. May it be set free from the worries of even my own limitations. Because you are unlimited. And you will provide for me. See, remember that David's desperation here is being driven by his time in the desert. He's in an arid, dry place. And he's wrestling with the reality. Somebody say reality. reality. With the actual reality of where he is. It's not a metaphor. It's not a simile. He's actually in a desert. And even more, the difficulties that are going on that are prompting this psalms are affecting his very soul. It's likely that this is when Absalom has chased him out of Jerusalem. Where he has an encounter with Ittai, where Shimei is throwing curses at him and rocks and dust. And it says that he comes to the place of rest and he encourages his own soul. And it's likely that there at that moment he's writing this psalm of Psalm 63. And as you move forward, you realize what's going on here. See, there are many things that God has accomplished in David's life. And there's many things that are yet to be achieved for Adonai. The key to unlocking a heavenly perspective is to first crush the carnal response of mourning or worrying about how will I be fed. How am I going to make it? How will I have the provision that I need? And instead, we respond with joy, with hope, and trust by clinging to the Lord. What are the actions of clinging to the covenant and to your covenant with the Lord? It is to set your heart upon the fear of God, taking oaths only in his name, constantly looking to him being the source of praise, him being the God who reigns supreme, and him making his people in quantity and quality like the stars of the heaven. So in this room, <clears throat> in this room, there are some of you who have personally received the supernatural provision of God for decades. Anybody willing to admit that? You've received some supernatural provision. There's some of you that can't raise your hand to decades, but you can sure raise your hand that God has been providing you for a short time here. In either case, he's given us his word that spans the existence of all mankind and all of creation. Before us at all times is one testimony after another, how he never fails to keep his word and is seeking to draw men into covenant with himself. What is true beyond measure is that God is faithful to rain down from heaven what you need day in and day out. Think about the abundance of his word and revelation that he has given you so far. How about the daily act of drawing you close to his face and breathing life into your soul, especially, especially in the times of desperation and being in the desert? If this is what he has been so faithful to do up to this point, Surely, he'll be faithful to sustain you to the end. If this is what he has so faithfully done for you up to this point, surely he'll be faithful 
in that same manner all the way to the end. Only getting better. I mean, he is the God who is filling you with what you need to inherit what he has promised and to fulfill his purpose for your life. And this church body as well for generations to come. See, when you throw off, annihilate, and crush that internal faithlessness of how will I be fed, and you begin to rely on the clear and consistent evidence of how he is feeding you, that then carries on as a witness and also a demonstration of faithfulness of how God is going to feed your future generations. Let's all turn to Exodus chapter 16. Verse 31. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. So after the great deliverance from Egypt, after the splitting of the Red Sea, after finding rest and refreshment at Elium, God hears the grumbling of his people and his immediate response is to rain down manna. More than just satisfying the grumbling of their stomachs, the Lord was giving them a heavenly sign to test them and see if they would keep his commands. In fact, the first of that command was to set aside an omer or about two liters of manna. And it would be a visible sign throughout their generations. Look, this is how God has supernaturally fed his people and will continue to do so. It was an ever-present testimony of how his people would never lack. It was there so that they may see with their own eyes the bread that fed his people in the wilderness and a testimony that God would never fail to provide for them. In fact, Psalm 78, 23 through 25 says this, yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven and he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate the bread of angels. He sent them food in abundance. Now, just within the, the confines of our own estimation of abundance, I really don't think that we can grasp exactly what the writer of Psalm 78 is saying. He sent them food in abundance. Now, this is far more than Going to some of our favorite restaurants that have all you can eat, you know, like Sushi Masa, Texas de Brazil. I mean, just gorging yourself until it's just coming out your nostrils. Do we really understand what God's abundance looks like? Well, to give you a better idea, let's revisit a weapon of old to refresh our memory. All right, Natalie, if you'll put up the first slide for us. So we're talking about, it says the grain of heaven, the bread of angels, this manna that is given. So work with this on a few slides here. In Numbers eleven twenty one, it states that there are a little over 600,000 men in the nation of Israel at this point. So with that, we added another 600,000 for wives, mothers, they weren't included with the men. Seemed fair. Then we added an average of three kids per every family. Now, if you took the average families in here, it's more than three. Looking at you, Carlos. <laughs> Should be looking at Patty. <laughs> so a conservative estimate puts three million people in the nation of Israel. Everybody say three million. In Exodus 16, 16, it talks about that the unit of measure was the omer. In most of your Bibles, it'll have a little measurement there, and it's somewhere around two liters. So we're going to use that as our estimate. So each one 
So each of the three million Israelites getting one omer of manna per day would equal what we have on our next slide. So that's six million liters of manna per day. That's 42 million liters of manna per week. That's 182 million liters of manna per month. That is 2.184 billion liters of manna every year for 40 years. Okay, now maybe you're like me and you don't think very well in leaders. Maybe you're American. America. We, be, we speak American. So I put it in gallons for you. Yeah. We like gallons. Barrels of gallons of stuff. So there's 3.785 liters to a gallon. So that means... If you're thinking in terms of gallons, you get one, almost 1 1.6 million gallons of manna per day. Per day. You get over 11 million gallons of manna per week. You get 48 million gallons of manna per month. Or you get 577 million gallons of manna per year. Somebody say, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's hard to imagine, though. 577 million. It's like ha over half of a billion. That's hard to contemplate what those are. So we tried another one to help you to understand this. Okay, let's talk about a semi-truck. We took an average that a semi-truck can carry about 9,000 gallons. There are some that carry more. There are some that carry less. We picked 9,000 gallons. Each semi is between 70 and 80 feet long when you include the... the the engine, the cab of it, okay? We're gonna use this here in just a second. So every day, you could fill up an 18-wheeler 176 times full of manna every day for the people of God. That's 1,200, more than 1,200 semi-loads of manna per week. More than 5,300 semi-loads of manna per month or more than 64,112 semi-loads per year. So if you take a semi-truck and we go with the 70-foot mark, and you stack them end to end, with 64,112 semi-loads per year, you can line them up and they would go across the entire state of Texas. It's a big, we're talking like 880 miles. 880 miles approximately from end to end at what this would produce. And these are conservative estimates if you take the 70 feet, if you take not the biggest semis that you could do. We're trying to give you an understanding that that was the case every year. Right. For 40 years in a row. That is an abundance of food that God provided. If you stacked up all the trucks for all the time, it would go around the world at the equator almost one and a half times. 33,000 miles? 33,000 miles, approximately. Equator's about 24 or 25, so you get almost one and a half. And there's more. Look, look at this. How long were they in the desert for? Okay. So all of this was every day for 40 years. That means that you have 2,080 weeks in that span of 40 years. And as per God's de declaration and command, is that he would supply enough on the sixth day that would carry them through the seventh. That means that there were 2,080 miracles of God providing on the Sabbath. Without fail. Without fail. How abundant is the storehouse of our God? Faithless thoughts of lack have no room whatsoever in comparison to what he is able to provide. Y'all want the title of today's message? Abundant bread. Abundant bread. And we're going to take this further than what you already expect. So the question that arises is this. What is the reason for the manna? 
Well, the most obvious answer is that God was displaying his provision for his people in a supernatural and overwhelming manner. Overwhelming, right? And yet there is more to consider. God was in the process of teaching them and even testing them so that they would develop a dependency on him for their every need. Forty years of abundant bread to teach and to test. It was to ingrain in them in the desert about his ability to always provide. They would learn every day what it would look like to look up to the heavens for their ability to survive and then even thrive in the desert. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes did not falter. There's an abundance of life being produced. But God was teaching his people to have a dependency on devouring the bread of heaven. He was teaching his people the dependency of devouring the bread from heaven. So think about this just a little bit more. You could not keep what you got today through the evening into tomorrow. You couldn't get that daily amount and start tucking something away off to the side because what happens? It would spoil and it would get it would become infested and you had to throw it. God made sure that you could not use tomorrow what he gave you today. A daily dependence. Do you realize that when he's saying, I want you to take an omer and keep it, that that omer never spoiled? So the same materials from heaven do not spoil when, it's, when it is following the command of the Lord, but spoils every time you try to reserve something for yourself. Over and over and over again. Get a double portion on the day before Sabbath because you're not going to get any on Sabbath, but it will last. And that morning of the first day of the next week, you're able to, to get more from God. This really should shed a deeper light on Matthew 6 than maybe we've taken a cre- uh, account for. Let's go to Matthew 6. We're going to begin in verse 7. Somebody say abundant bread as you're turning. Yeah, I see Assad was on it. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. I, before I move on, I'd like to say guilty as charged. Trying to get God to hear me because of my words. Trying to do other things than just actually speaking to him. Ever been guilty of praying because you want someone else to hear something that you're trying to pray? Encourage someone else? Direct someone else? Lord, I pray they repent. (laughs) When you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they're going to be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. By the way, this is Gentiles that are praying. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask. You do realize that the children of Israel didn't even ask for the manna? (laughs) You do realize that the children of Israel were complaining and grumbling? They were asking to go back to Egypt. And he said, I know what you need. And thus begins the cycle of 40 years of manna for his people. Miracles every day in such a preponderous, overwhelming, supernatural amount. And so as we're talking about this, your father knows what you need before you ask. And he tells you to pray and ask. Pray like this then. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us today, Lord, 
our provision that we need. We don't need anything that will go beyond. I just need what I need for today. I just need to go out and get a fresh sampling of the bread of heaven, of the grain of heaven, of the bread of angels. I need to see this food in abundance in my life. Think about the riches of what you have received. Think about it. You, right here in this room. What if we started to expand this to think about the lessons that you've learned? The things that God has spoken to you. Are you still at a point where you're devouring it the way that you first did when you got here? That devouring of the word. That longing to be in his presence. What was it like on day one when you woke up and the manna was out there and it was the most amazing thing? They literally said, man, who? What, what is this? What is this? I, uh, we're going to call it manna. Okay. Which is really just kind of saying, what is this? The first day, man, that must have been amazing. The first time that you kept food and tried to keep it overnight because you didn't want to wake up early in the morning. You just wanted to sleep in a little bit and it turned rotten. And then you got to clean all that up inside your little tip. The first time that you got to a Sabbath and you got twice as much on the day before and it lasted you until the next one. What about the 700th time that you did the same process? What about the 7,000th time that you did the same process? Are you ready to devour it the same way on day 7,000 as you were on day one? But isn't that what we're cultivating here in this place? By this prayer, Jesus is saying, give me today. What I had yesterday was wonderful and I praise you for it. But what do I need today from your presence, Lord? The pattern was supposed to teach you that you needed him more, not that you can do with him less. Because you can open your word now and get something from the heavens. Should not decrease your hunger, your desire, your longing for him, because you are now getting something that the Bible has called the grain from heaven and the bread of angels. He's giving you something that is so special from his presence. Can we say that we need to stir up a hunger in our hearts today? We need to be devouring the word. We need to be devouring what he's give us, given us. So again, our question to you is, what is the reason for manna? Let's all turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we're going to pick up in verse 1. Yeah, say abundant bread as you turn. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. That's always a, good, a, a fun study that we don't have time for this morning. But that you may live, increase, enter, possess. The promised land was always the goal. But it begins with feasting and holding fast to his commands. Verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. In order to pad your ego. Nope. Make you feel better about yourself. So that every day can be a Friday. What's that first step in the process? To humble you. What... What does that begin to highlight about ourselves? It's our propensity to pride. It's our propensity to begin to provide for ourselves a variety of things, but basically it's just absent of what God's word already says. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word. That comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, let's focus in on this humbled and causing you to hunger. That is a, a time period, a moment, a season 
where you are denied. Denied of the, the free access of provision. That you don't have to really feel the depths of hunger. And there's a purpose for that. It turns out that we need to be denied things to ensure that our hearts stay devoted to the Lord. That's true. This connects ex exceptionally well with a wonderful and powerful message that Carlos and Chris Riasor preached last Thursday. God is after the goal of our hearts being wholly devoted unto him. Treating as precious and dear every morsel that he rains down from heaven. But the process of us maturing means that we're told no by our heavenly father. And by him saying no, he's actually helping us grow to a place of being wholeheartedly devoted. He's ensuring not just your present, but he is ensuring your future. How many things have distracted our devotion of today and we're just now figuring out how much has it impeded our future? But our Father is good. He's good to discipline us. We see and know clearly from engaging his word, the many sermons, teachings, and conversations that we had, that his bread is his word. Know it plainly from th this passage. It's his commands that are constantly set before you. Let me read to you Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, Yahweh Sabaoth. See, our engagement with him, with his word, with the very thing that is breathed by the mouth of God, it has the Ruach HaKodesh behind it. It is to be a joy. A clear indicator of my heart is that when it's not a joy, something's wrong with me, nothing's wrong with the word. Oh Lord, set my heart free. Oh Lord, enlarge in my heart to receive the abundance of your word. May I look to you and ask, give me this day my daily bread. Because you have the only thing that can not only satisfy my soul, but it is what gives me clarity of your heart and your will to be done on earth. In Deuteronomy 8 and verse 15, look what it says. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert or wilderness. That thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. Oh, we didn't have that part in the earlier conversation. He brought you water out of hard rock. In the Psalms, it says it was like a sea of water that he put forth. If he gave that much provision for the manna, how much water would they need as well? Abundant provision is what he provides. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your fathers had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. Asking and receiving daily bread is a design by God to humble you. You can't keep storehouses. You can't keep a pantry. You can't keep these things in this regard because the Lord wants and is demanding and is training you. He's humbling you. He's testing you so that you must go to him every day for the bread that you need. See, our dependency is seen in us devouring his bread from heaven. For what end? So that it might go well with you. He knows what you need well before you're even able to articulate it or ask for it. He's been leading you in this process. And then one day you're like, oh, I know what I need now. Do you know how you're able to do that? Because he's been leading you with his daily bread. He's been feeding you. He's been humbling you. He's been testing you. And you just now get to the point where you know what you need to ask of him. And then you realize he's already had the provision on the way. You realize he's been working on it the whole time. And you are just now becoming aware of it. But us devouring his daily bread is what causes us to be in the right position. Anybody ever made the right decision and you had no idea how it got there until you realized that God was helping you? 
it just came to me that I should do this. You dumb dumb. Humble yourself. Do not fail this test. You thought you needed more provision, but what you needed was to devour more of his daily bread. You remember when you first got married and you lived on zip? And then what happens, though, is we expand the course of our life thinking we need more and having to provide for ourselves in the process. When you eat of his daily bread, he makes sure that it goes well with you in the end. The truth is, is that his daily bread in your life allows you to have what you need to be able to devour your own faithless thoughts. When you devour his word, you can then devour your own faithless thoughts. That's what he's training us in. When we're devouring his word, we devour our own faithless thoughts. And what remains is a faithful walk. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 14 and say abundant bread as you turn. Abundant bread. Look, we've been thoroughly blessed by the life of Caleb and looking at the faithfulness of a Gentile inclusion joined in covenant with Israel. We covered this passage last week, but there's a hidden gem that we want to connect. Verse 9, only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Now, remind me again, I'm kind of slow. I need some help from time to time. Who is saying this? Caleb. Caleb. And what had Caleb already witnessed up to this point? 18 wheeler loads of manna. Abundant bread from heaven. While in the midst of faithlessness, rebellion, wickedness, how was he able to stand at Kadesh Barnea and stare into the promised land and see giants, but also see an abundant, good, and spacious land? And say this, for they are bread to us. That means just as God has so faithfully provided to feed us day in and day out, surely we're going to chomp them up. Surely we're going to bite and devour them because they are nothing in comparison to the abundant supply of what heaven is able to give us. I will eat them like my daily bread. I will go out and gather them, cook them, make cookies, sandwiches, pizzas, whatever it takes. All varying kinds of giants. I just know this is for my consumption. You want to know when the turn really happens in maturing? Is that when you're no longer just sitting in a high chair and waiting for somebody to put something in front of you so you can smash it in your face. It's when you begin to sit at the table of adults and you say, Lord, yes, I want your manna so that I can be filled with your power to go and devour the giants that are in front of me. I want to get up and go do something with this word. I want to put it into effect. I want to swing that sword and reclaim those weapons of old. I've got work to do. Well, that's a big turning point in my life. Somewhere around between 8 and 10 years old. I was an overgrown, oversized kid. And then I was put to work. I hated it. I hated getting up early. I hated having to go outside and sweat. I was a lazy bum. I just wanted to cling to a donut. <laughs> consume it and then do it all over again. But praise God for good fathers. He says, son, it's now time to be a man. It's now time to take everything that I've trained you to do and go put it to work. We're made to accomplish, saints. We're not just made only to be fed. And that just as faithful as God is to give you the daily bread of his word, he's also faithful to give you the daily bread of giants. No longer be surprised whenever a, a major issue comes about. And you don't yet know the clear and decisive answer for. Rub your hands together. Lick your lips. And say, this is my daily bread. I'm going to devour it. 
And praise God, we don't just get to, get to do this individually. We get to do this together. Look, it wasn't just Caleb. It wasn't just Joshua who went in and conquered Canaan. It was him and all of his brothers with him. So think of it like we get the daily participation of a potluck. Everybody's going to bring something to the table. Your giants are my giants and vice versa. So say it's time that we grow up and transition to a greater level of maturity and see the bread that God has put in front of us. And yes, it's the teachings. We have to be fed by that. But it's all so that you have the substance and sustenance to go out and conquer. Somebody say that's a good word. Doesn't that change the Lord's prayer in Matthew 6? Give us this day our daily bread. Oh yeah, my provision. A word from the heavens. But Lord, give me the enemy that I can conquer today. That I can devour today. That that giant that can fall before me today. Because that is actually what you begin to pray for. You're not afraid of the giants in the land. You actually want to go after them and take them down. You want to devour them because the God of all creation is with you. He's empowering you. He is moving with you. See, when we spoke of in October about the weapons of old, mastering the weaponry of old. You may remember it. We're not going to turn there, but you can go back and look in 2 Kings 11. You can see that they went and who's... Whose weaponry did they get? They got King David's weaponry. Tried and true. Perhaps it wasn't just about the kind of metal that was used or the formation of the large and small shields or the swords. Maybe that was they could go back and see that it was tried and true. And maybe even more important than that, they saw the attitude of the man that said, I am longing and yearning for the Lord as if I were in the desert. I'm going to go after everything that God has given me to do. In the process of this church, what happens is that you secure ministry for the next generation. You secure ministry for the next generation and the next one after that. What we are doing here is securing ministry for the next century. That's the way that we are looking at things. Raising up men and women of God who will not just be couch potatoes, donut holders, but there'll be men and women who can go and get from the bread of heaven, including the attitude that says, I will go and make war on the enemies of God. That's what we're building here. See, and having every man with weapons in his hands, and you're ready to devour the bread of his word, and therefore you're ready to devour the enemies of God that rise up. Go with us to Joshua chapter 5. Say abundant bread as you're turning. Before we read this, it is our joy. It is our joy to continue the generational work. And it is our joy to send out our best at every time that God commands. But you know what's also our joy? To raise up even better. And that's you. Realize that you're put in a, a very unique and blessed position. You get to see men that have gone before you, sent out. And whatever locale or destination God has called you, your current and present time is to raise up, rise up, and grow to greater levels of maturity. To feast on his bread. And that is definitely his word. But the heart and charge of this morning is to realize what you're fighting for. And you're fighting not just to be fed from heaven, but you're fighting to use what you got from heaven to advance his kingdom on earth. Joshua 5.1. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear. Now, if we rewind 40 years prior, when the bad report came to all the Israelites, the Israelites' hearts melted in fear. 
But look at what 40 years of abundant bread has now produced in God's people. They have transitioned to a greater level of maturity. They themselves, the second generation, has walked, along, walked across on dry land. And God's heavenly witness is going before them and now causing their enemies to melt in fear and not their own. 40 years of being faithful to follow God's commands, feasting on the abundant supply of his word, guarded the hearts of God's people from faithlessness and fear. This was met with God's supernatural signs, and the nations Israel was destined to dispossess. They melted in fear, and they began to retreat before the battle ever began. Yeah. Realize that this is immediately prior to the battle at Jericho. So let's skip down to verse 10. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated Passover. The day after Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. Unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. You want to talk about entering into God's promised land and what it looks like to say, give us today our daily bread. It's yes, Lord, give me your word, but give me those giants and the spoils of conquering. There's no longer any manna, but it does not mean that God was not feeding them. It was now a more matured diet. Right? No longer that heavenly bread but now something they had to go fight for and conquer. They were entering into a greater level of maturity and began to eat the fruit of what they were destined to fight for. Actively engaging what God has abundantly said and fulfilled over the course of 40 years. In this event, like we mentioned earlier, prior to entering into battle with Jericho, they could look back at what God has already done, celebrating Passover, which was the inauguration of their deliverance out of Egypt, and therefore the provision that they received in the desert that kept them alive. But here's the point. And so that up to this point, they could know for certain that he'll do it again. Look at the abundant provision that God has done since we got out of Egypt. And as equally true as that fact is, so is the truth of how he will continue to do so. Drawing from the storehouse of gratefulness and remembers that he has given us is a means that we can look back and see, recount, be revived by what God has already done. In fact, mastering the weapons of old and using what he's already given us through his word to victoriously accomplish his will is there so that we can do it in the midst of difficulty. Look, if we're able to accomplish God's will when it's easy, I would venture to say it's probably not accomplishing God's will. But it's in that de desert, it's in that difficult, in difficulty that we find the opportunity to let our soul cling to him and to realize that his right hand has been with us this whole time. So they are in the plains of Jericho. They're camped at Gilgal, the place where reproach was rolled away, and they are standing and preparing Passover feast, likely staring right at Jericho. The story of Jericho is in the next chapter, but think about where they are. Out of all the times that you would have thought God would just keep providing the manna, they get to Passover, they eat the fruit of the land, and then the next day the manna stops. Why? Because it's time for them to fight. It's time they have to have, they have enemies that are before them. God will continue to provide for them. But now not only are they fighting against the enemy, but they're having to tend the land. They're having to cultivate. They're having to produce food. They're having to fight for it in every single way. And that's God's kindness. That's his 
provision for them is that they can be, then begin to ask for daily bread in every way. I want to remind you of something. The daily bread that they had for 40 years was designed to humble them, test them, and teach them about God's ability. They could look back and see what God had done, have confidence in what they need to ask for today, and have hope and absolute dominance about what God will do in the future. I want to read to you a prophecy that this church got several months ago, but I want to read it to you now because it moved us and it is for today. I have called more arrows. It's time for us to fight. I have called for men to go to arms. I have a plan and I have targets set apart. I've drafted each one of you into the same quiver by my design. I'm going to take a pause from reading this to address you for just a second. God brought you here. He called you into this quiver. He has intentionally brought you here. Every one of you that are here that make this your home, God has brought you here. Goodness gracious, you can't even find this place unless the Lord helps you a little bit. We're surely not advertising anything. You surely didn't come from the environment, the building, or the surroundings. You have to park 97 miles away and bring your kids in. God brought you here because he has a purpose and it is for you to daily devour what he has so that you can devour the enemies that he's pointing us towards. The prophecy goes on. I've been shaping you. I've been causing you to rub shoulders with one another to form you and produce in you that which I desire. But as of late, I am doing that which has been forgotten. I'm placing the head of the arrow, the spear tip upon you. You will not fly with a blunt arrow that produces that which has existed for millennia. You will fly and you will produce what I gave the apostles originally. I am jealous for my bride. I am jealous for a church that reflects me. I'm jealous for a church that is as I design it. And I'm equipping you. To be able to pierce into the darkness and be able to produce that which I desire. And not the same fake church that has existed in my name and has claimed to love me, but cares not for that which I care. Listen to this final sentence. I'm producing in you the power to produce the real thing. He's producing in you the power to be able to produce the real thing. That's why God is calling to us and saying, I want you and you must devour. You must get this daily dependence upon me. Learning, longing, seeking me out. Because I have not only bread that I want to give you, the bread of revelation. I have the bread of enemies that you must consume. That you must devour them because I have created something. The Lord has formed you. He's shaped you. He's called you to be here. Not that you just might be another dull and blunted instrument in his hands. But that you might be sharpened by his presence. That you might fly straight according to his word. That you will hit the target. And lest you think the target is just about you. It's never been only you. But he is using you. He's invited you into the covenant. He's invited you into this place that he might use us. He might use you collectively to achieve what he has. That will require that like an arrow in a quiver, some are going to be sent. It will require that others are continue to be honed so that God may send them. It will require that you stay in the quiver that God is able to sharpen you through the process of rubbing shoulders brother to brother and sister to sister. There's a wartime fight that is upon us. And the daily battle that we have is that you would yearn and devour the bread of heaven that you might be able to devour God's enemies. Saying, stand to your feet.
going to read to you out of Matthew 7. It's going to give us directive of what to do right now. Verse 7, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son ask him for bread, will give him a stone? What we're going to do right here and right now at this altar is approach his throne as sons and in confidence. And we're going to ask for bread. We're going to ask for bread with the expectancy, the hope, and the surety that it's more than just revelation for me. More than that it's just healing for me. It's, Lord, give me what I need to go out there and help them win and conquer. Lord, give me the bread of facing giants. Let me eat them today like I would breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We're saying approach this altar with the tenacity to fight with what God has already given you. And as you raise up your hands, as you raise up your voices, you begin to find that God is pouring into you already the abundance of heaven for everything that you need for others. Sure, we look around our, our church body and we see there are impossibilities. What other land are we called to? But I serve the God who helps us experience the possible in all impossibilities. So as you approach whatever has been a desert moment, here, right here is the cure to that. Let your soul cling to God. Be refreshed and reminded that his right hand has been with you. And right here, lift up your face to him and say, Father, feed me with your bread. Feed me with the expectancy to face giants and not melt in fear, but let me cause them to fear. Mighty God, we come before you. We thank you for the abundant bread that you provide, Lord. We come forward today with tenacity. Lord, we come forward yearning, desiring to devour your bread. Lord, both the revelation that you provide and the enemies that must be defeated, that must be defeated for our brothers, for this house, and even your desire for the nations. Lord, we ask boldly that you might give us the nations. We ask boldly for our brothers in Serbia right now. We ask boldly, Lord, that you would cause those giants to fall for them. Lord, we honor you in this house. In Jesus' name.